Good day, and welcome to part three of our BYOD 2.0 webinar series. Today we're going to talk a little bit about wireless tuning and some lessons learned in earlier BYOD deployments. My name is Bill Carr. I am the Chief Mobility Architect at Com Solutions Company. One of the things that we've really discovered in our early deployments is that the traditional uh, coverage models that are used for RF planning are completely obsolete. Um, to give a little background on that, in most environments when we did building planning, uh, even just 12 months ago, um, we would look to cover an area with RF to provide a certain signal level or signal strength. By doing that, I equate it to building a, a cellular nationwide network, but not taking into account how many simultaneous phone calls it can support. So we blanketed with RF, and now we have an issue where we have the user and device density that uh, is much higher than we anticipate for traditional coverage models. Also in the past, when we did these, these coverage models, we would sometimes supplement the coverage model by talking to a, a customer and finding areas where there were known uh, congregation points, uh, auditoriums, uh, computer labs, um, public lobbies, cafeterias, now what we're starting to find is those areas of user density are now outside of the IT department's control. Um, someone like myself who carries a laptop bag in with four or five devices in it um, could actually turn your lobby into a high-density RF environment. So now that we have these coverage models that are obsolete, we have to start dealing with things like uh, channel assignment and transmit power that are no longer as simple as they were um, when we were doing coverage models. Once we start to deploy a higher density of APs, we have to worry about things like co-channel interference. We also have to do detailed RF planning. Our, our planning must include uh, looking at uh, building materials and attenuation sources and trying to look at uh, usage patterns. Where will the users physically be? Are the devices low or medium height or then near ceilings or near floors? So we want to avoid simply adding more APs, um, which uh, in many cases will actually create more interference than, than good quality signal. We're also recommending that customers quickly attempt to move away wherever possible from supporting 2.4 gigahertz clients for their legitimate business uses. There are things that we can do to relegate that band for guest or BYOD services. Um, in certain vertical markets, especially healthcare, uh, this has been a trend we've seen taking place for a couple of years and now we're starting to see it need to take place in other enterprise accounts, uh, as well as in the education space. One of the big issues once we start to have high user densities is the fact that in the U.S., um, we'll take the 2.4 gigahertz band, for example, we have three non-overlapping um, 20 megahertz channels. Um, so for any given space, without having to get into worry about channel reuse, we can really only support you know, 150 to 200 users uh, in, in that space. As we start to move into 802.11n, or 802.11n in the 5 gigahertz band, we have um, nine uh, con contiguous 20 megahertz channels in the 802.11a uh, band, or the 5 gigahertz band. However, if we start to do 40 megahertz channel bonding in that band, we quickly find ourselves with simply four channels there as well. So we end up in a very similar situation. One of the things that we also have to be concerned about is a variety of client types. We don't necessarily always have a um, homogeneous group of clients that all use the same types of radios and use the same type of band and have the same drivers. Um, and as we bring BYOD devices into our environment, that uh, variety increases even more. So this chart's really meant to, to dictate um, kind of the differences between an environment where you have all high throughput capable 802.11n clients and then a mix of some legacy 802.11a clients um, in, the, in that same space, and how with the number of clients on an AP, how our throughput will decrease dramatically once we have a uh, mixed mode of clients. So the biggest challenges we've saw in BYOD 1.0 deployments is that we underestimated client counts. Um, because of those, those uh, underestimates, the quick fixes were usually rollback subnet masks, and we created huge broadcast domains. There's a number of things can be done to reduce the client uh, lease times or adjust idle timers uh, in the wireless LAN solutions. 
that doesn't necessarily always solve the problem. In many cases, we need to use technology such as VLAN polling, where we can create smaller broadcast domains, um, as well as uh, create smaller subnets. I have seen some customers begin to uh, remediate the parasitic losses of um, iOS devices, for example, which will join any open network, by starting to add uh, pre-shared key encryption um, to their uh, open guest networks, and even simply, simply including the pre-shared key in the SSID name. Um, that's really somewhat useful if you don't have if you have a lot of transient clients that will never return to your network space. Um, and it's really not done from a security perspective. It's simply meant to reduce the number of parasitic devices that uh, uh, associate to your network and, and use up your DHCP and IP and association resources. Uh, we're starting to see service expansion beyond port 80 and 443 becomes a management nightmare. Um, customers have noticed they have to open up specific ports for email. You know, it's, uh, it's a firewall uh, Swiss cheese uh, environment. We don't want to continually have to make changes to our BYOD environment to support um, a single policy for all of our BYOD D devices. So it's very important that we get to some solution that provides true role-based uh, definition of what is a guest versus what is a contractor and what is a visitor. What do they need access to? We're also starting to see multicast services such as Bonjour, customers that are using Air Display or Air Print um, and find that they can't support them in their enterprise uh, BYOD environment, uh, we have the experience to help you. And, and, and in many cases, customers don't have multicast services deployed on their wired side. So there's no way they're going to have them deployed on their wireless side yet. Um, uh, ironically, most customers um, don't have it on their wired side, and we're starting to see the demand come from the wireless side. We can assist you in, in some solutions to provide um, subnet to subnet support for services such as Bonjour. We also find that treating all of our BYOD 1.0 users as a single class of users doesn't work well. We'll find that a CIO or CTO does not like the fact that every time their iOS device goes to sleep, they have to re-authenticate via the web. You know, it sits for five minutes and then they have to start all over through the authentication or registration process again. Um, so we, there's some things we can do to assist you with that as well. So what can we do today? Well, for customers who are uh, utilizing the Aruba Network's wireless LAN controllers, we would recommend that you deny inter-user bridging unless your clients require, require it. This will reduce significantly the amount of traffic. It's also good from a security perspective. If you have no need to support peer-to-peer -peer wireless clients, um, the only known applications for that today are things such as uh, air display or air print uh, or wireless printing. Um, there's no need for you to support it. Wherever possible, you should band steer your clients to the 5 gigahertz band. And in high density areas, we want to talk about um, whether you should enable or disable uh, 40 megahertz channel bonding. For our education customers, we've spent some time uh, really evaluating what happens to a idle wireless user. There's a timer uh, called the idle timer that is designed to keep a, a user's firewall state for a period of time before we consider them idle and off network. What we want to avoid is a client having to re-authenticate or re-associate uh, every time they move from class to class. The default for that timer is five minutes. In some environments, we've adjusted it to 10 minutes to account for what we call the bell ring to the next click time. Um, we can la uh, layer upon uh, your existing captive portal authentication features such as MAC authentication to override the default guest settings. So we can actually assign different roles or simply eliminate that multi-view during the day of the same captive portal page to help support those customers that uh, don't want to see a captive portal on the same device more than one time during the day. Com Solutions would also love to help you uh, with uh, assistance in a ClearPass evaluation um, for ClearPass Policy Manager, ClearPass Guest Services, or any of the other ClearPass modules. And we'd also like the opportunity to talk to you about ClearPass or ComCare services where we can assist and provide um, our real-world experience uh, on a consultative basis that, to leverage the investments you've made in your infrastructure today. As we said uh, before, we can also assist customers with deploying multicast services to their wired infrastructure and also help support that on their Wi-Fi infrastructure. We also recommend that you leverage 
tools to effectively manage your wire to wireless lands. Uh, if you have not seen or had an, uh, the opportunity to view the Aruba Airwave solution, uh, please contact uh, Comp Solutions. We'd be happy to assist you with that as well. Thank you for your viewing of our third video in our webinar series, and we hope to talk to you soon.